There we go. As an introduction, we like to acknowledge our mission at Vos Library, which is to advance learning, inspire curiosity, enrich lives, and promote community. With that in mind, let me introduce our guest. With an MS in Earth and Space Sciences, Sean has over 35 years of experience in planetariums, having directed facilities in Hawaii, Kentucky, and Maryland, as well as managing the construction and installation of a number of facilities in the US and abroad. He is responsible for all operations and management at the Versant Power Astronomy Center. He has presented numerous planetariums, shows, led educational workshops, and been invited an invited guest lecturer on astronomy and planetariums in Argentina, Brazil, China, Germany, Greece, Japan, New Zealand, and Russia. He has taught undergraduate astronomy courses at the University of Louisville, East Carolina University, and the University of Hawaii at Hilo, using traditional and online methodologies. Sean served as president 2017 to 2018 of the International Planetarium Society, and the, which is the world's largest organization of planetarium professionals and is a NASA JPL solar system ambassador. He has a passion for cultural and historical astronomy and sharing the wonders of the universe with people of all ages. Without further ado, please help me welcome Sean Lodge. Hello, Sean. Hello, thank you so much for uh, having me and inviting me to uh, join you tonight. Um, and uh, looking forward to sharing a little bit with you about the night sky. We're gonna be talking a little bit about stargazing and uh, binoculars, telescopes, uh, and a little bit about the deep sky. And in particular, there's a telescope that you're able to check out uh, from the Bose Library. And we'll uh, talk a little bit about that. I'll show you, give you some tips and hints on how uh, to do that. So I'm going to see if I can start by sharing my screen here as well. And uh, we'll kind of kick things off and um, kind of go from there. Uh, while I'm driving, I can't really monitor the chat. Uh, so I'll leave that up to, to uh, Deborah to do, uh, but uh, we can always go back and, you know, if you, if you do have questions, put them in there and we'll, we'll definitely do some Q&A as well. So um, I'm up here at the Versant Power Astronomy Center, which is at the University of Maine in Orono. Um, and um, you may be surprised by that name because we were, up until this past October, the Amera Astronomy Center. So, of course, Versant uh, purchased Amera. Uh, this past year, and then uh, recently we've been actually engaging in a rebranding piece for that with the university. And there's a whole process here at the University of Maine to make those changes, but uh, so we're now going to be changed to the Versant Power uh, Astronomy Center. Uh, and the Jordan Planetarium, which is uh, still the original Jordan Planetarium, uh, named in honor of Maynard Jordan, who was um, the first person to teach astronomy here at the University of Maine and, and whose family uh, had the planetarium built back in 1954, to give you an idea. If you've not had a chance to visit our planetarium, we invite you to do so. Uh, the planetarium is currently open. However, normally we seat 50. Currently, we can only seat 11 due to pandemic uh, restrictions. Uh, and of course, uh, visitors do have to basically purchase their tickets in advance if you do decide to visit us. Um, there are uh, a variety of uh, uh, COVID protocols in place, including face masks being recovered at, uh, required at the University of Maine that cover the nose and mouth at all times. There's hand sanitizer stations set up, all of that. Uh, the main feature is our planetarium, which is a, uh, a 10 meter or 33 foot diameter dome with 50 seats. Um, and if you haven't been to a planetarium recently, planetariums are almost like, uh, I often like to say that a modern planetarium is like an IMAX on steroids, because um, in addition to showing you the night sky, we can wrap you and basically immerse you in new environments, not just astronomy and space, but all types of other things. And we do a whole variety of sciences here at our planetarium. And we have a, a small little lobby area with a classroom as well, with some interactive exhibits. So uh, if you are interested, we do public shows on Friday nights at seven for general audiences and Sunday afternoons at two for families with children. Um, along with uh, typically lots of school groups, though this year they're primarily on Zoom, kind of like this is. 
So, uh, so tonight, as mentioned, we're going to be talking about telescopes, uh, binoculars, and the deep sky. And uh, here you see a whole variety of telescopes. Telescopes um, come in a wide variety of sort of shapes and sizes, if you will, and we'll get into what some of that means. Uh, but uh, here you're sort of seeing a, a couple different types. You're seeing a traditional pair of binoculars, which is a really great way to get started, uh, you know, exploring the night sky. Uh, and then you see a couple other telescopes. So this is what we would call a refracting telescope. And over here, this is a reflecting telescope. Um, and they're on different types of mounts too, which we'll get into and why uh, you might want to prefer one mount over another in terms of when you're doing your exploration of the sky. So I tell folks, if you're new to astronomy, it's just like anything else. Uh, we all start somewhere uh, and uh, you know, you normally can't just start running. So usually folks have to sort of crawl, walk, run. And I often tell folks that crawling is learning the basics of the night sky. So learning the constellations, the stars, where the planets are, things like that. Then walking is sort of that next step. Uh, dipping your toe in the water might be to start off with a pair of binoculars. Binoculars will give you an idea of some of the things that you could normally see in the sky and give you a closer view. And they also will give you a little bit of an idea of what to expect through a telescope. Many, many times when you see uh, pictures, uh, be it online or in books, uh, they're taken with long exposure times and uh, sometimes have really dramatic colors. And typically we don't see that with binoculars or a telescope. You do see some color, but they're subtle. Um, and they're not the really super vibrant colors like you see in some of those long exposure uh, images of things. So binoculars give you a good idea of what to expect uh, when you're looking through the small backyard telescopes. And then telescopes, of course, are running. That's really diving in and uh, doing the, the, you know, really taking that next grand step, if you will. You're, you're lucky in that you can check one out from your library, and that's a great way to get started without uh, the major investment that telescopes typically are. So I highly encourage you to do that and, uh, and check it out too. So learning the constellations is, as I mentioned, sort of your first step. And I'm a really big proponent of books in general. Um, in fact, I was uh, talking with uh, Deborah ahead of time and saying, you know, that I learned all of my constellations initially, uh, of course, by uh, books. And, and these are some of, the, some of the ones I highly recommend. Nightwatch in particular uh, is one of my favorites. Uh, one of the nice reasons I like Nightwatch a lot, I'm gonna see if I can actually um, fix this a little bit here. Give me one second. Let's see if I can go back and change my video here for a moment. I'm going to change my background here because that that uh, background, if you will, won't won't allow me to. Uh, uh, I might not be able to do that while I'm sharing my screen. Oh well, well I'll do that a little bit later. But anyway, Night Watch is one of my favorites. One of the reasons I like it, I'll try this and see if it shows up well. But it has really nice. Um, no, nah, it's not going to show up. I'll have to show you later. <laughs> but it has really nice star charts in it. It starts you off with the basic constellations and doing something called star hopping, which I'll show you a little bit later as well. Uh, gets into binoculars and telescopes. And then there are some uh, sort of in-depth charts with it uh, that show you, you know, the constellations and then show you some of the deep sky objects that you would be looking for with binoculars or telescope. Turn Left at Orion is another really great book. It's uh, written by Guy Casamagno. Um, uh, he is currently uh, only just recently actually became the, uh, the chief uh, astronomer for the Vatican Observatory. Um, and Constellations, this one is a book, a, a relatively new book by Will Tyrion. And Tyrion does quite a few uh, constellation uh, books and things of that nature. So again, uh, but books are a great way. There's lots of them. Uh, so when I was coming up, I, I started learning my constellations when I was a kid because I really got into it. Um, I used the stars and uh, also the constellations, those two books by H.A. Ray. And if any of you remember Curious George, uh, <laughs> uh, the constellations was kind of the one geared for really young children and, and the stars geared for sort of middle school and adults. So that those are some other fun ones that you can use too. Um, today, of course, uh, folks often like to use uh, computer uh, aids to help as well. 
Um, and these are just a variety of apps. NASA has an app that has quite a few things on it. Um, there's also uh, Starwalk and uh, uh, Sky Safari and Star Map. These are all different apps that you can find and are available for both uh, Andro Android and um, iOS if you are a, um, an, uh, an Apple user as well. Uh, but these, some of these have the function that you can actually take them out and with your phone or a tablet, you can be pointing in the area of the sky and they will track the sky. And that can be helpful too when you're first learning your way around. So um, these apps, and there's a number of them that are free. Uh, there's also of course ones that you can pay for, but the free ones are just as good. Um, and then uh, I'll mention a few other things. Uh, one of my favorite websites, heavens-above.com um, allows you to basically create star charts that you can print out or you can look at online. Uh, it will show you when the International Space Station and other satellites pass over. Um, it's a really useful resource for looking at the night sky. Um, and you can set it up for any time and place when you log in, you just search by the city you're in and you can you know, set it up and it will set up the sky for you the way it would look from your own backyard. Stellarium, I'm gonna be showing you a little bit later. This is a free program online that you can download um, and it will allow you to uh, look at the constellations, but then also zoom in and take a closer look at the night sky. It's a desktop planetarium program. It is free and open source. Um, so the price is perfect. Um, and again, it is a really powerful one that lots of folks use. And then there's another one, the Sky Live, uh, which is just another website uh, that has a variety of information and you can do some fun things with. So all these things will kind of get you started in learning your way a little bit around um, the sky. So that's going to be very helpful because one of the things I tell folks is if you have a, if you have binoculars or a telescope, you can just scan the sky. That's fine. But if you really want to be finding certain things, if you want to find where the planets are, for instance, if you want to find where the Orion Nebula is, you need to know where Orion is. Or if you want to find where the beehive cluster is, you need to know where Cancer the Crab is. So really learning those constellations is really an important piece. Uh, of being able to find your way around the sky. Today, there are telescopes that have computer control that you can just type it in and it goes to things, but usually there's some setup there. That's okay, but I'm, I'm old school. I really think that you'll get a lot more out of it by finding things yourself in the night sky because then you'll, you might stumble on other things and it really gets you to really learn and understand a little bit more about the sky too. So uh, one thing that often happens is I get calls here at the planetarium. I saw this thing in the sky last night, and can you tell me what it is? And I'm like, well, maybe, uh, but I need to know some information. So one of the things I often will say well, is, well, where was it in the sky? And sometimes people will say, well, it was, you know, it looked like it was 10 feet above the ground. I'm like, well, I, I can't really use that. I know, I know it's what you're thinking, but we measure things in the sky in terms of angles and degrees. Um, and so typically, you know, if, if you, you ask me, you know, what was this thing I saw in the sky last night, I'm going to ask you what direction and sort of roughly the height it was of, uh, in the sky. How high was it above the horizon or something like that? And to give you an idea of, of some angles here in the sky, uh, the moon is about an, a half a degree in angles, angular size. Um, and to give you an idea, the sun is also that same size. That's why it, it appears that even though the sun is much larger, it looks the same size as the moon. That's why we can have total solar eclipses where the moon appears to block out the sun is because they're the same angular size. And then you can see th there's a picture of the dipper, the, the distance between Mizar, or excuse me, uh, Dubey and Merak, which are the pointer stars and the dipper are about roughly five degrees or so. And then there's a guy sort of stretching out his hand here. And this gives you an idea that it's 10 degrees if you have a fist stretched out in front of you at arm's length. Um, and the nice thing about that is if you measure from the horizon, which is where the earth and sky come together to the point straight over, you should be able to put nine fists on top of each other. It's 90 degrees, basically. So typically, if you're looking at something in the sky, you would say, well, it's, you know, it's in the east and it's 10 or 20 degrees above the horizon. Then I could say, OK, well, at that time and the time would be the other thing I'll need to know. But if you tell me it was at seven o'clock last night, 20 degrees above the horizon in the east, I would say, OK, well, this is probably what you were looking at. All right, that's enough information to go on. Um, but I wanted to show you that there are some ways that you can measure an angle. Your finger, uh, index finger is about a degree stretched out at arm's length. Um, your hand, again, is about 20 degrees or so. 
So there's a couple different ways of measuring, sort of giving you a, a tool that you have attached to your body that can help you measure things um, in the sky. So that's a, a, often a helpful tool for looking at things. Well, let's say you've learned your constellations or at least got started learning your constellations and now you wanna dive in and, and start to do a little bit of walking from that crawling stage. And I often say, again, the first step is, you know, binoculars. And one of the reasons I like binoculars is binoculars you can use not just for stargazing, but you can use them for bird watching, sporting events, you name it. Um, you know, so they're kind of multi-purpose in that regard. Most of the time, if you get a real astronomical telescope, you're not going to be using it for watching many other things because it will either turn the uh, object upside down, flip it, or it'll be front to back or reversed image because again, astronomers don't care if something's upside down in the nighttime sky. There's no up or down in space, so we don't worry about that. Uh, but binoculars are a really good, uh, good starting place. Um, and typically with binoculars, you're gonna see two numbers that are attached, usually 10 by 50s or seven by 35s or you know, 18 by 20s or whatever. You know. So the first number is the magnification. So that basically tells you that it's going to take that first number, like for 10 by 50s, means that it's going to make whatever that object you're looking at look 10 times closer. All right. The second ob the second number is the diameter of the objective. That's the largest, the larger lens, if you will. And that's the part that gathers light. And that's really important because telescopes, really the most important function of a telescope is not magnification, it's gathering light. Your eye does this as, a, at well, as well. Uh, your eye basically changes. If you go into a dark room, the pupil will dilate to let more light in, so it gets bigger, all right? And then if you go into bright sunlight, it shrinks down to only let a little bit of light in. Well, you can sort of think of telescopes being that way. If you have a larger diameter uh, objective, you're gathering more light. And if you have two uh, uh, telescopes or binoculars side by side, the larger the, the diameter of the objective, the more light it's going to gather. And even if they're at the same magnification, your view will be clearer, uh, typically through the one that has the larger diameter, because it's gathering more light, which really is what allows us to see. I highly recommend that you start with 10 by 50s for, for astronomy purposes. But if you have a pair of 7 by 35s or 7 by 50s, that will work as well. But 10 by 50s is a nice, uh, good starter binocular uh, to get you going. And uh, you can see there's a whole variety of different sizes here. These are some really big ones, uh, like 20 by 80s or even, uh, you know, uh, even larger sometimes. And binoculars typically either have a roof prism, which means they have a, a, a prism inside, which turns the image right side up. Or sometimes we call a poro prism, where they basically have the system of a couple prisms inside. And again, that flips the image over to make it appear right side up and front to back correct again, not reversed. Um, and that's another reason people like. A tripod will help with uh, basically stabilizing your binoculars. So one of the things that most people don't realize is that if you have a pair of 10 by 50 binoculars, you have an object nearly as powerful as Galileo's first telescope. You can see the moons of Jupiter with it. You can see a variety of nebula and star clusters with it. Very easy to do with a pair of binoculars. Now, the thing about it is, is if you're magnifying it 10 times and you're holding these binoculars in front of you, any movement you make, the tiniest movement you make, that is magnified 10 times. So if you're looking at the moons of Jupiter, which are going to appear as little tiny star-like stars near Jupiter, which is going to appear just as a little bit of a disk, and you're hold, trying to hold it, it's going to be very difficult. So a uh, tripod really can help. If you don't have a tripod, the other thing you could do is you can lean up against the side of a building or a fence, something that's stable. That also can help you see more with your binoculars uh, as well. Because again, having some type of stabilization will help. Because again, any movement you make, even if you're rock, you think you're rock solid, you're still moving a little bit, and that's going to be magnified. It even, even gets worse with a telescope, which is why telescopes always have to be in some type of mount or tripod or or desktop mount so that you can you know, use them without shaking too much. But binoculars, there's a lot, and there's also a lot of different books out there about binocular uh, astronomy, but they're a really great uh, way to get started. And lots of people already have them around their house, again, for bird watching or sporting events or other things. So they're a great way to get started um, in, in basic astronomy. 
Next up then, once you, if you, you've dipped your toe in and you say, oh, I really like this and I wanna go even farther, then the next step typically is to jump in with a telescope, if you will. And telescopes uh, come in a variety of different types and sizes. And most people often think of telescopes like being this first one on the far left-hand side. That is what we call a refracting telescope, basically two lenses. In fact, a refracting telescope you've just seen with binoculars. Binoculars is basically two refracting telescopes with an extra set of prisms or mirrors inside to flip the image right side up and, and front to back, if you will. Then we have a reflecting telescope, a Newtonian reflector. Uh, that uses a curved mirror, and I'll show you how these all work. Uh, this one here is called a catadioptric optic one, or sometimes it's called there's different names for them. There's uh, smith cassegrain Cassegrain, but basically they're a, they're, they use a bit of principles of both the reflector and the refractor together. Um, and this is another reflector, but just on a different type of mount because telescopes come in different types of mounts too. And the mount sort of depends on what you wanna do with your telescope. Some people just wanna look through the telescope. Others might wanna do photography, astrophotography, where it needs to track the sky. And in that case, you want a different type of mount to help you be able to do that. So telescopes basically gather light and allow us to examine an image at a focus. That's basically what a telescope does. And there's three functions of a telescope, magnification, resolution, and light gathering. And I mentioned before, light gathering is actually the most important thing a telescope does. Magnification is the least important thing a telescope does. Uh, resolution is in the middle, all right, because it helps you resolve an object. And that's basically seeing the fine detail or splitting objects that appear close together. All right, that's gonna be the resolution part. Now, I mentioned magnification is the least important because really, again, in terms of what you're seeing, yes, getting some magnification, making something appear 10 times closer, 20 times closer is gonna help. Uh, but again, one thing that most folks don't realize is you can make any telescope magnify as much as you want. However, there is a limit. Telescopes can, effective magnification typically is 50 times per inch of aperture or that diameter. So if I have an eight inch diameter telescope, the maximum magnification under the best conditions when the sky is just behaving perfectly, is gonna be 400 times. If I want something that magnifies, you know, a thousand times, I need something 20 inches in diameter, all right, to give you an idea. And again, that's under the best of conditions, all right? So oftentimes you'll see telescopes at department stores, you know, Walmart, Target, uh, Kmart back in the day, Sears back in the day. And sometimes you'd see these little telescopes that were two or three inches in diameter and they'd say magnify is 575 times. Well, yes, you could make it do that, but all you would see is blur, all right? Because it would push it well beyond what the telescope really could be used for. So again, uh, remember that that diameter, that light gathering ability is really the important piece. And also, if you have an eight inch telescope next to a four inch diameter telescope and you magnify both 50 times, again, that eight inch has so much more uh, light gathering ability that the image is gonna appear much brighter, much clearer to that eight inch. Because again, assuming the optics are of the same quality. But so magnification, resolution, light gathering, but light gathering is the most important uh, aspect of a telescope, if you will. So how do these telescopes work? Well, just real quickly, refracting telescopes basically have two mirror, uh, two lenses, excuse me. There's a, a lens at the front and a lens at the back. And the, the, the front lens, the objective, that diameter, that basically bends or refracts the light to a focus. Um, now, a long time ago, old types of refractors used to have something called chromatic aberration because they bend red light and blue light to a different focus. Nowadays, they use a whole variety of exotic glasses to correct for that. Uh, but they're still limited in size because you have to support this lens at the front. Um, and so today, most modern telescopes are either a uh, reflector or what we call compound um, telescopes, where their primary uh, primary uh, objective is a mirror, if you will, a curved mirror. So Newtonian has a curved mirror at the bottom, light comes in, strikes that curved mirror, bounces off, bounces up to a secondary flat mirror and then into the eyepiece through a lens, all right? Um, and again, mirrors don't have that chromatic aberration, red light and blue light reflects equally to a focus. So you don't have the color, color issues you can sometimes have 
uh, with refractors. Um, and then a uh, compound telescope basically uses a system of mirrors and lenses, sometimes corrector plates. So this one light goes through a corrector plate, hits a curved mirror, bounces up to another secondary or to a secondary here, and then is folded back. The advantage is you're taking a long telescope and you're folding it into a short tube. And that is sometimes helpful in terms of the size of, of telescopes. So some of the really largest telescopes in the world nowadays typically are these sort of compound telescopes, if you will, to give you an idea. All right. Now, telescopes typically have one of two types of mounts. Um, and the, the two types of mounts can come in some slightly different flavors, but it basically boils down to two. You have one's called an equatorial mount. An equatorial mount has two motions. One axis is pointed towards the pole star or the, 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 the celestial pole, if you will, here in the Northern Hemisphere. So you have it pointed towards Polaris. And what that means is that it can track because you're going to move everything in, in the declination axis is going to track. So if you find a star and the Earth is turning beneath your feet, you can have this telescope tracking by only moving in one direction in terms of tracking. The other type is what we call alt azimuth. And that basically moves up and down and side to side. All right. So that's kind of a point and shoot, if you will, versus the equatorial, which again is going to move on these two different axes. So this axis here, this polar axis, is going to be set to your latitude. So here in Orono, for instance, it's about 44 degrees, a little before 44 and a half degrees north. So you'd have to set that at 44 and a half degrees north. Um, if you were down in Boston, it's about 40 degrees, so you'd be at 40, you know, so you have to set it uh, depending on where you're from for that tracking to work. If you're going to do photography through a telescope, you're going to need at least any type of advanced photography, you would need to use an equatorial mount. Uh, some cell phones can do some very basic photography through alt azimuth, but again, for most serious astrophotography, you would need this equatorial mounted telescope, um, if you will. When you're getting started, I often recommend the alt azimuth. They're easier, a little bit easier to use and point and shoot. And again, if you just want to look at the sky, you don't need that uh, extra mount, which typically is more expensive as well because it has to have a counterweight to balance the telescope, all that sort of stuff. So the telescope that you can check out from the library is an Orion uh, Star Blast. And it's a four and a half inch diameter telescope uh, to give you an idea, and this shows you this telescope is designed to be set on a like a picnic table or a table outside or a card table. So that's one of the things that you you typically would do. That's why it kind of has it, it is an alt azimuth mount. It basically moves up and down and side to side, swivels around like that um, to give you an idea. Now I'm going to stop sharing for a moment here. And now I should hopefully be able to choose change my virtual background here since I have my There we go. So now hopefully you can see me and I'm going to turn my screen a little bit because I have a telescope behind me. This telescope here, let's see if I can turn that just a little bit there. So this telescope here is basically the same kind of telescope is the, as the Orion Star Blast. The difference is this is on one of those equatorial mounted telescopes. So if you look closely here, you can kind of see this is the polar axis, and if I if I was setting this up outside, I'd have to have this pointed towards that north north polar star, if you will, as a counterweight on it. And so once I set it on an object, it basically just will move like this to track that motion of an object across the sky. So that would allow it to do the tracking uh, of that. But this telescope is again the same size as that star blast that you can check out from from the Vos Library. It is a, uh, a Newtonian reflect, re reflector, blah, I can speak, <laughs> reflector. And so this bottom, the mirror is down here. Um, and then basically light comes in through this open tube, strikes that mirror, and then comes back to a secondary mirror in here. If I turn it down, I don't know how well you can see that, but you can kind of see there's a mirrored surface there a little bit anyway with that. And that's that, that mirror that's inside. So light comes in, hits it and then bounces up to a secondary, which is a little diagonal. And then up here, you have the eyepiece. Um, and the eyepiece is how you change the power of the telescope. Um, so basically, there are these different eyepieces that just drop in and out. Um, and uh, you'll see that they normally have, I don't know 
how well you can see this, but they normally have a number on them. So this one says 10 millimeters, for instance, and then behind you have some other eyepieces here. There's a, uh, let's see, here's a 28 millimeter, uh, and this one I think is a 15. So they ha have these different sizes. If you looked at these, you would notice something. You can sort of see the size of them. So the 28, of course, is the sort of the largest, you know, sort of widest area compared to the 10, which is just a little bit. Now, what you do in terms of figuring out the magnification is on the side of the telescope, you'll see that this telescope, it has, it says that its focal length, or FL, is 450 millimeters. All right. And basically, to figure out the magnification, you would divide the focal length of that by the focal length of the eyepiece. So this is 450 millimeter focal length. If I divide by a 10 millimeter eyepiece, that's going to give me 45 magnification. So with the 10 millimeter eyepiece, this is going to magnify 45 times. All right, to give you an idea. All right. Uh, so if and if I had you know a five millimeter eyepiece, then I would get it up to 90 times. Now remember, since this is four and a half inches in diameter, uh, again, the maximum I could do with it um, is, you know, basically about 225 times or so to give you an idea. All right, but basically by changing out the eyepiece, that is going to allow you to change the magnification. Now what you want to do when you're looking through it is you want to start with a really high number one, like the 28, because that's going to give you a really wide field of view. That's the other thing. When you magnify, the field of view through your telescope is going to go down. So you want to start with low power. And once you start with low power, then what you can do is get your object in focus, find your object and get it in focus. And then you can swap out to the other eyepieces. And you have a focus here You'll have to change the focus. Typically, the eyepieces, you'll have to change the focus when you do so. But you just use this little rack and pinion up here, which just moves it real slow in and out until you get focused. The other thing I tell people is be careful. You don't want to stick your eye like on the lens, if you will. You, you know, eyepieces have a different amount of relief. So many times you want to have your eye, I would say, you know, anywhere from like a half an inch to a quarter inch away to start. And you can move in a little bit and move out, but you'll come to a place where you can actually see through the telescope. Sometimes people want to put their eye right up against it and that makes it very difficult. And sometimes people want to get, stay too far away. So you, you sort of want to start off with about a half inch or a quarter inch away from the eyepiece um, to really be able to take a look. This is one of the reasons that we can't open our observatory here at the right now, because of course you have to get your eye really close to it um, and it's a COVID risk because uh, we normally would have a, an observatory that opens up on Friday nights after our public shows, but for now can't do that. Um, so again, you're going to want to, you know, get relatively close. You'll also notice this telescope has this little, uh, and I'm going to see if I can get a better angle on that for you, maybe. Um, it has this little, I don't remember my camera's reverse too. <laughs> Uh, this little finder scope on it here. Uh, and this little finder scope, basically, it's, it's a reflex finder. And you'll turn it on, it has a battery inside. And when you turn it on, you'll be able to look through it. It basically is like a reflex finder. It has a dot. You're not going to see the dot projected, per se, like a laser is projected. But you can look through it, and, and you basically have a clear window and a little red dot. And that red, red dot is lined up with the view through the telescope, because that way you can point it at a constellation, point it at an area of the sky, and that gives you, again, there's no magnification on that, so that allows you to see the area of the sky, see the constellation, and then you'll know where to put that red dot in terms of looking for objects in the night sky. Uh, and then you should, once you have that red dot in the area, you start to look through the eyepiece, and then you'll probably end up doing a little bit of adjusting. And remember, that the more magnification you have, the smaller the adjustment that you'll make as you're moving this telescope around to be able to find things through it. All right, so I start with, a, like I say, with the widest, I think the telescope, I think the blast comes with like a 25 and maybe a 10 millimeter eyepiece. I think there's a couple eyepieces that come with it. Um, so start with the 25 and then work your way up to the 10 um, in terms of uh, using eyepieces. And that gives you a little bit of an idea of how um, how this telescope works. The other thing is with telescopes, um, you know, there's, 
your uh, when you go outside at night, you want to make sure that when you set it up, you have it in an area that you're not going to, you know, kick it over or bump it or things like that. That's one of the nice things about the tabletop mount one is you can sort of be sitting at a little table outside uh, to use it. But some telescopes will be on a tripod like this, and you can actually set the tripod up or down depending on how high you want it to be. Um, but this is the, the, the blast is a really good um, beginner telescope and will give you a good idea of some things that you would be able to, you know, to look at in uh, your nighttime sky. So, all right, let me go back here and go back to this screen here for a moment. So anyway, I did want to show you that you know that this is basically the same type of telescope. In fact, if you look at this one, it even says it's a it's a uh, blast as well. It's just on a different. It's on the equatorial mount versus that um, classical um, or that alt azimuth mount um, that we just showed you to give you an idea. Well, the planetarium here. I, I'm just going to mention we also have an online astronomy club where we do weekly online star parties on Friday nights at eight thirty. Um, and you can find out about that on our website. And uh, we actually are hooked up to some robotic telescopes, both in the Canary Islands and Chile. Uh, and so we do some observing through that. And so uh, uh, that's kind of something. And these are actually images taken through those telescopes. So it's, you know, there's the gal uh, galaxy, Bard Spiral, and there's Saturn, and of course, um, Neowise back when it was around. And this is Lagoon Nebula, just to give you some ideas there of some things. All right, well, I'm going to switch over now. ahead and do that to Stellarium. All right. All right, so hopefully now you are seeing um, an image here, this is uh, Stellarium, and Stellarium is this desktop planetarium program, um, and we can sort of move in and out here a little bit. I set up the sky here for 5 p.m., uh, which is, uh, again, about an, a little over an hour ago now, almost two hours ago now. Um, but one of the reasons I did so is you may have heard there was a very special event that took place back on the 21st of December. We had something called the Great Conjunction of Jupiter and Saturn. Um, you can still see Jupiter and Saturn right away as soon as it gets dark right now um, in your nighttime sky. They're going to be low over in the southwestern uh, sky. Again, this is 5 p.m. You're going to need a, a horizon that's clear of buildings or trees or anything like that uh, in the southwest to see them. But Jupiter typically is the fourth brightest thing we can see in our sky after the sun, the moon, and the planet Venus. Um, so it's hard to miss. And Saturn is faint by comparison, but when they're close together, that uh, is a nice group. And uh, back on the 21st of December, they were at their closest approach um, since the 1600s or so, so over in over 400 years, and they came about a tenth of a degree apart, um, so almost nearly appearing like they were touching in the night sky. Now, the reason I mentioned this group and I wanted to show it to you, even though this is a little bit, is next week, uh, basically Sunday evening and Monday evening, Mercury is going to join these two planets in the night sky, and it's going to make a nice little triangle here right after sunset. Uh, Mercury is going to be sorted down this area, and Mercury is called the elusive planet. It never gets very high above our horizon because it orbits interior to, of course, the Earth. Um, and uh, so it's a really great chance to see all three of these planets in a nice little tight triangle on Monday and Tuesday night. So if you have a chance, you might want to, or excuse me, Sunday night and Monday night is when they're going to be at their best. Uh, so if you have a chance, you might want to get out and take a look uh, for those. I'm going to put time into motion here um, a little bit, and we're going to go forward. And I'll take you to about right now, roughly. There we are. Uh, so this is the sky right now, uh, about 6.40 in the evening or so. Um, and uh, you'll notice by that time, Jupiter and Saturn are already set. Um, however, Mars is high overhead right now, and you'll notice there's a, a Uranus is next to it. Uranus is at the edge of your uh, 
basically your, your human eye visibility. If you have a really dark sky with not any lights in the way, then you might be able to catch uh, Uranus and it would appear basically as a, the faintest star you would see, if you will. But Mars is relatively bright and Mars we're going to be hearing a lot about because uh, Mars is going to sort of be invaded, if you will, uh, in February. There are three spacecraft uh, planning to land on Mars. Um, there's one from the UAE called Mars Hope. There's uh, one from China uh, called Tiananmen, I think it's called. And then there is, uh, of course, the Perseverance, which is uh, the JPL, NASA JPL one, which is scheduled to, to land there. So three landers headed uh, off to Mars, uh, all going to be landing in February or so. So uh, Mars might be in the news quite a bit that month. Um, but Mars is a good planet. You can take a look at it through the telescope. You'll notice some dark markings and sometimes some polar ice caps uh, as well. And you'll notice a bit of a red color. Well, I mentioned constellations because constellations really are your way to find your way around the sky. So we're going to we're going to sort of face south and southeast here. I'm going to rotate around just a little bit here. And I'm going to take you just a little bit later. I know this is about right about the time it is right now, but I do want to go just a little bit later. And in fact, I'm going to go to uh, we'll stop right about there. So this is the sky about 8.30 p.m. tonight, facing the southeast. And winter is one of the best seasons to start learning your way around the sky because the constellations, the stars of the winter season are some of the brightest that are visible throughout the entire year. So if you can, you know, start in winter, I know it's cold, bundle up, you know, make sure you stay warm, but winter's a great season to start finding things. So to begin with, one of the groups you wanna be looking for is this group of seven stars right here. And it's called Orion. And the stars Betelgeuse and Bellatrix mark up his shoulders, Rigel and Safe are his legs, and three stars in a row are his famous belt. And uh, if we grab one of those stars there, Betelgeuse, we can actually draw in Orion. So he kind of looks like a stick figure. Um, he's been called a hunter and the, Greek, the Greeks uh, called him, of course, Orion. Uh, but the Egyptians called him Osiris and uh, Native Americans called him Long Sash. Many people saw him as a hunter there in the night sky. Um, if you had lots of imagination or maybe a little too much wine, uh, you could maybe see this, uh, you know, crazy figure there that the ancient Greeks imagined uh, in the night sky sort of as a hunter there. But again, constellations are that. They're imaginary pictures that people drew a long time ago. Uh, you know, and they use these for navigation, for timekeeping, knowing when to plant and harvest, things like that. Um, and they often have lots of different stories and legends that go with them. Now, the nice thing about Orion is right below his belt, there's an area called his sore. And you might notice, even with your unaided eye, you're seeing something just a little bit fuzzy there. But if we zoom in a bit, and this is something you'd want to look at with your telescope, this is something called the Orion, the Great Orion Nebula. It's a cloud of gas and dust, a stellar nursery, if you will, a place where new stars are, are being born, right below the belt of Orion. And it's one of the best studied stellar nurseries. It's really beautiful. It's really bright. Uh, so even binoculars will give you a little bit of a view there of it. Uh, telescopes give you even more. Um, and basically, there are some really hot young stars inside this cloud, which are causing it to glow uh, and ionize and light up. Uh, but that is one of the really best studied ones there in the night sky. And again, if you find Orion, which is pretty easy, he's some, made up of, you know, some of the brightest stars visible uh, in the winter season. You can use, use his belt, jump, drop below that, and you want to put your dot sort of in that area of Orion right there to give you an idea. Now, if you find Orion in the night sky, you can use him to do something called star hop. Star hopping is an easy way to learn your way around the sky. So find Orion, again, because it's made up of these seven bright stars, the shoulders, the legs, the belt, all right? And if you find that, draw a line through his belt. And if you come down uh, sort of and to your left or to your east, you're going to come to Sirius. Sirius is the dog star. It's part of Canis Major Orion's hunting dog. Um, and if we kind of zoom in here a little bit. There are three stars above that that mark up the head of the dog. Sirius is sort of where the collar would be. Here are the front legs, the body of the dog, and the hind legs. And so if we draw in Canis Major now, there you're going to see that's kind of Orion's big dog right there. And there's his collar and his head up there. A line through Orion's shoulders 
brings you over to Procyon and Gomesia. And these two mark up Canis minor or the little dog, but in my estimation, looks more like a hot dog is what kind of dog can you make with only two stars? Again, the Greeks had pretty vivid, vivid imagination as did other cultures. Um, and, when, and sometimes they name things in honor of stuff. And that's probably the case with this little dog. So again, with lots of imagination, you could draw in, there we have Canis Major, Canis Minor, Orion's two faithful hunting companions who will follow him across the sky on his hunts. Well, if we come to back to Orion, this time we're gonna use his foot star, Rigel. Come up through his belt and shoulder, Betelgeuse. If we keep going, we'll come to two stars that look alike. Their names are Castor and Pollux. They're the heads of the Gemini twins. One twin has sort of a long body with short stubby legs. The other twin, a short body with longer legs and their arms come through this area here. So those are the Gemini twins, right like that. Back at Orion, we use the belt and go the opposite way. We'll come up to Aldebaran, the reddish eye of Taurus the bull. This V-shaped group is called the Hyades and marks the face of the bull. And if you extend it out, here are the tips of Taurus's horns. And riding on the back of Taurus is a little tiny cluster of stars that people often mistake for one of the dippers because it looks dipper-like. That is the Pleiades or seven sisters. In Japan, they call it Subaru. If you ever look at a Subaru automobile, you'll notice those stars on its hood emblem. In Hawaii, they call it Makali'i. Lots of different groups have different names for it, but it's supposed to be, again, an open star cluster. This is a great cluster to look at with binoculars. With your unaided eye, you can see six or maybe seven. With binoculars, you're gonna see it actually resolves into several hundred stars uh, there in the nighttime sky, because it's an open star cluster. Now, if you find Taurus, the bull, right up between his horns, if you were to zoom in between his horns a little bit, right around this area right here, we have something that is called the Crab Nebula. You see I'm zooming in here slowly but surely, but this little object here, the Crab Nebula, this is a place where a star has died, the supernova remnant. It was first spotted back in 10, uh, uh, 1051 AD. Uh, basically, it was a star that blew itself apart. It became so bright it was visible during the daytime for several weeks. Uh, and now when we look at it, we see this leftover cloud of gas and dust where a star uh, blew itself apart. But the Crab Nebula in Taurus the Bull. So you do want to sort of, you want to start by finding Taurus and then sort of looking between those horns closer to the one that is nearest Orion. Or sort of looks like he's charging at Orion. That's where you would find that Crab Nebula up in that area. And there's a whole bunch of star clusters in Gemini. There's star clusters up here in uh, this other group of stars too. Lastly, if you draw a line up straight up through Orion's belt, you come to Capella. And Capella along with this Pentagon shaped group of stars is called Origa or Origa. In Hawaii, they call it Hokule, which means the wreath or lay of stars. Uh, if you ever go out to Hawaii, you might get a wreath or lay of flowers but this uh, wreath of stars. And to me, that makes a lot more sense than the, what the Greeks called it, which was Origa. Uh, and they saw it as a chariot driver who was carrying a goat. Now, I don't know about you, but I have a hard time making a chariot driver carrying a goat out of a pentagon shape of stars. But again, in some cases named in honor of something, that's probably the case. Origa was an, must have been an important figure. So anyway, this whole area of the sky we've been looking at is called the winter circle or winter ellipse. And again, if you find Orion, you can star hop to these other constellations. And again, there are numerous deep sky objects in them. I showed you the Orion Nebula, the Crab Nebula. Up in, in Origa, there are a number of open star clusters. If we zoom in a bit, you can see some of these open star clusters. There's one right over here. Um, there are several of those open star clusters in Origa as well. Um, and uh, so that's another thing that you'll want to check out there um, in your sky give you an idea and there's some down here too. So lots of different ones. Um, and a really another really famous cluster, if you've come off the sort of the tips of the horns of, uh, or excuse me, the heads of the Gemini twins and you come down here a little bit, um, there is another group of stars right over in this area here called the Beehive Cluster. I'm gonna see if I can, there it is right there, the Beehive Cluster. And this is a nice open star cluster that's really beautiful in binoculars, but it's called the beehive. Uh, those stars are gravitationally bound together. So that's right. Sort of follow a line from these two heads of Gemini coming off 
And uh, down here, there's a star called Regulus, which marks the heart of Leo the lion. There's a backwards question mark that's sort of the head and mane of Leo. So if you come sort of halfway in between, sort of drawing a line like you're bisecting between those two and scan, you would find that uh, beehive cluster there, um, which is actually in Cancer to Crab, a really faint group of stars between Gemini and Leo there in your night sky. So um, I know we're running out of time here. I'm going to rotate around really quick to the north. Um, if you were facing north, here you have the seven stars of the Big Dipper, which also is known as the Great Bear. Um, the Great Bear has uh, a few stars, a triangle out in front that mark its head. The front legs come down like this, the hind legs like that. So if we grab one of those stars there, now you can see the Great Bear. A line through those first two stars out the open end, point you to the North Star. And then from there, you can come down and trace out the Little Dipper, which is fainter and is right down to here. So there's that Little Dipper. And we can grab it as well. Oops. There we go. And there's the Little Dipper. Uh, North Star is of the 50 brightest in the sky, is 43rd on the list. It's not a very bright star. It's actually, the only reason it's important is because it's directly in line with our axis of rotation. And that's why we can use it to find our direction north. So uh, all the sky, when we put time into motion, you would see that of course, all those stars sort of appear to uh, rotate around that north star. And it stays stationary. That's why we can use it to find our direction north. All right, so. I know I'm just about running out of time here, so I want to make sure that we have time for questions. Um, and uh, so, yeah, any questions about night sky, telescopes, binoculars, how to get started, anything like that? Well, there's nothing in the chat right now, um, Sean. So if folks would like to unmute and just ask the questions, or you can type them in, either way. And here, uh, here now that you can see a little bit, this is uh, again that from that Night Watch book. And one of the things I like is it has the constellations drawn in, but then it also has uh, a chart with just the stars so that you can kind of go back and forth between the two. It helps you learn the constellations a bit. That, again, that book Night Watch that I mentioned is uh, really, you know, the, the library might even have on hand. Um, and then when you go in farther, it has these, these advanced charts just to give you an idea show you uh, things that you can find in the in the sky as well. Um, and have, you know, some of the deep sky objects like there's the Andromeda Gal Andromeda in the Andromeda galaxy, things like that. So again, it's a really great book, uh, basic beginner book on how to find your way around the sky and uh, use binoculars and a telescope. So, but yeah. Thanks, Thanks, Sean. Um, my name is Pete. I live in central Maine down in Randolph area. Mm -hmm. I just want to comment for people. There are a couple of astronomy, several astronomy clubs in the state uh, up by you is the Penobscot Valley Stargazers, mm -hmm. uh, which anybody can join. It's like 20 bucks a year or something. And down here in the Augusta area, it's Central Maine Astronomy, uh, Astronomical Society, CMAS, mm -hmm. and there's some in Southern Maine. And if people want to get involved in um, have some help. Uh, the, those are great little outfits to belong to. Um, you mentioned binoculars in the beginning there as a beginner thing. I've been looking at the sky for over 50 years and I'm still beginning because I prefer binoculars. I've got a nice pair of 10 by 60s mm -hmm. that I spent like 300 bucks on with a tripod. And I'd rather not buy a telescope because I know um, it's going to take me a while to learn all the technology that goes with that. Um, Obviously it opens up a whole different world, but I really, really prefer a pair of binoculars, good ones on a tripod, because I've looked at, you know, occultations, uh, you name it, I've probably seen it. I've really been looking for messier objects on good nights mm -hmm. and I can just pull my chair out, pull my binoculars down and pull out my nice little uh, sky atlas and uh, just spend hours just looking through binoculars and trying to find messier objects or even Uranus or uh, Neptune. Um, and several months ago, I, I found um, when Mercury was up, um, 
for a few days. Uh, I really, really stood out well with binoculars and I'm going to be using them here in the next couple of nights to try to find them when they come up to Jupiter and Saturn. So I just wanted to add in here that um, I just love binoculars because I, that's what I prefer doing and I have a whole blast doing it. Um, you know, if, you, if people want to invest in telescopes, they can, but there's really quite a learning curve there. Um, and you really, there's so much technology involved with them. I just haven't want to gone there yet. I, it's just, I can take my binoculars out and in three minutes I can be looking at the stars. Yeah, that's one definite advantage. You can grab and go and there's no setup time, uh, as you mentioned. And, and I, I do, yeah, I, I second the notion to uh, astronomy clubs are a really great way to get involved because you get to talk with people who are interested. Right now, most of them are doing things via Zoom because again, it's it's really not safe to be sharing eyepieces. So that's a little bit, you know, that's the other right. issue. Um, but yeah, the Penobscot uh, Valley Stargazers typically meets the second Monday of the month. So I think next Monday, the 11th is when they should be having their regular meeting um, and they'll probably have something online. Um, but yeah, there's CMAS, there's a, a whole variety of them. And, and of course, one of the nice things too is those clubs often participate in the Acadia Night Sky Festival which right. is a big event. Uh, last, this past year, we weren't able to do that, of course, because of the pandemic, but keeping fingers crossed that there might be some options to do that this fall. Um, with telescopes, I will mention, you know, you can, you, you, you mentioned the technology side of telescopes. One of my favorite telescopes, and I, I think I showed this early on in, in, my, um, in my video screen, um, I'll have to see if I can uh, escape this one screen and, and see if I can go back to it, but um, one of my favorite types of telescope is a Dobsonian, which is just a point and shoot uh, type of telescope. Uh, let me see if I can share that real quick here once again. Um, and, and it's sort of like the, the, the one that is uh, like the Star Blast here. Uh, this one is very much like the Star Blast. That's like a six or eight inch version, but it basically it's just point and shoot. So in terms of the technology side, I often say that you can get telescopes that are really basic, just point and shoot. They are more than binoculars, of course, and they will take a little bit of getting used to in terms of changing out eyepieces. But then you can go all the way to the ones that have, yeah, fancy computer control and all of that. Um, and my, me personally, I don't use the fancy computer control ones. We have one in our observatory for research purposes, but like for personal looking, I like the point and shoot telescope because you end up finding stumbling onto things sometimes as you're as you're exploring it. So I highly recommend that. Um, but you know, with the library, you can check it out and give it a try and see if you like it too. So that's something else. Yeah. Thank you, Pete. Anybody else yep. with questions for Sean? Got a couple thank yous in the chat, Sean. I know we covered quite a bit tonight. So um, if it's folks it. do have questions, you can always email me at planetarium at main.edu um, is, is a, a really simple way to, to reach me. Um, and we have a bunch of web uh, resources on our website, astro.umain.edu, including that Stellarium site and Heavens Above and all those others too. So you can poke around there a bit. Um, John, it is but, always but, so cool to hear someone talk um, with, the, with the passion that you have for astronomy. And uh, this was really educational tonight and I really appreciate you joining us. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, I am gonna to wrap things up and hopefully if you have questions for Sean, you'll, you'll reach out directly to him. And here's my, here's my wrap up. So this concludes our presentation for this evening and all of us at Vos Library Thank you for attending our Zoom with Vos Wednesday series, and we hope that you'll spread the word and also join us next Wednesday, January 13th at 6 p.m., where Don Reamer, author of Seen Anything Good, talks about his book and adventures of birding in Maine. So thanks, everybody. Good night. Be well and stay healthy. Thanks again for having me. Make sure you get out there and look up. <laughs> thanks, Sean. Deborah, can I ask you a question?